My name is Frida Nigeluk, I'm from the Linguistics Department and I'm hosting today's speaker. And it's a great pleasure to have her around, um, Constanze Veit uh, from Hello. the University of Luxembourg, who is a very versatile researcher with a <laughs> broad range of interests, uh, many of which are connected to research we're doing at SOAS, among other things ethnography of multilingual, multimodal practices mm -hmm. um, in Moroccan families in France, um, literacy acquisition in multilingual contexts and also multiscriptural contexts and orthography transfer. So she's, if I'm not mistaken, she's worked in the past with Moroccan families in southern France and now Having been transplanted to the multilingual context of Luxembourg, she is looking at multilingual orthography uh, teaching in Luxembourg classrooms. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frederica. <laughs> Thank you very much that, for having invited me. Do you, do you understand me when I, when, I, when I talk like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I worked for, during my PhD, I worked uh, in southern France, was interested in minority languages in general in, in southern France, first about Occitan languages, so uh, uh, an, an autochthonous language like uh, Basque, Catalan, Breton, and then I was curious about how, how do different minorities, or yeah, called minority, language minorities, uh, read and write and have reading and ri writing practices uh, in France. And um, after having look, looked very closely to Occitan families, I, was, as I went over to a typical um, group, uh, immigra immigration group in France that was Moroccan families. And I, uh, I did my PhD uh, about, about literacy practices, reading and writing practices in families and at school in Occitan French-speaking families and in Moroccan Arabic French-speaking families. Um, I was trained, that was my PhD and my data, uh, what I, my, my collected data in this time uh, date, dates always already from 2003. I published my, my PhD in 2007. Seven. But I, uh, I, was, um, I was looking back recently um, in, a, in a particular in a bit particular frame of my linguistic data I had collected during my PhD and this is what I will present to you today. Maybe just a, a word about my background. Um, I am not a Semitic, fluent uh, person. Really, um, very, very. No, I, I don't speak Arabic. I, um, I did two years of classes of Arabic and of Moroccan Arabic and Standard Arabic. I'm a Romance linguist, and at the time of my data collection in 2003, I managed to uh, follow the Arabic classes of the 10-year-old children I will, uh, I will show you, and I managed to live half a year in a Moroccan family who did code switching between Moroccan Arabic and, Fr and French. But we have 11 years later, so my Arabic still uh, is not, uh, yeah, did not happen to, to practice it. Um, so uh, in my um, when, I, when I, I, I chose the title about conflicting expectations and multilingual literacy acquisition for the, for the talk today, and um, maybe when you look at writing or literacy, it is, more, it is even more than the spoken language, it is more submitted to, um, to norms and to, uh, to an idea of correctness. Um, and when you have reading and writing acquisition in a multilingual context, uh, this idea of norms and of what is written correctly depends on the different literacy practices and the families and the informal surroundings and it depends on the very explicit, very much prescriptive, prescriptive norms uh, in schools. So, uh, and t children, oh, in, in, my, in, in my study it will be children um, at primary school are confronted between this, or in, in this family, uh, family surrounding um, norms and what they learn at school and what they have to do at school. Um, so in this different, when you have a, the Arabic group in France it, and these literacies are so, so different, um, then these competences may get in conflict in these different social groups, families against schools. And I was curious how the children will deal with these different literacy acquisitions. I will, I will present to you in a minute. 
So today I will present you a group of 10-year-old multilingual children growing up in southern France with a Moroccan background. Um, and I will briefly pre present you the findings of an ethnography which I did in my PhD and uh, where my PhD was focusing on of these literacy practices in the families and schools of these children. Um, and I will focus today on some writing of these children in their family language, Moroccan. Moroccan is not a written language, so you, uh, adolescents or adults often write uh, Moroccan Arabic in, um, in chat rooms, in SMS, etc. But they don't write, and it's not a standardized written language. Um, and most of the family members did not mean that they, uh, so they asked very often, can, you, can one write Moroccan Arabic? Is that possible? Uh, so for them it's a very dialect. And um, in my ethnography, I, I focused on this conflicting expectation, expectations of French and Ara Arabic literacy in families and schools. And in the orthography analysis I will present you now, um, I was asking how the children deal with the literacy requirements within the task to write down this family language for the first time of their life. The aim of my talk is to present you my study, of course, but however I would like to discuss afterwards the methodological framework, doing an ethnography and then a structural orthographic analysis at a time which focuses very different perspectives of, uh, of the setting and, and the results are complementary, but they can be discussed being how, how complementary they are. Um, maybe for, for those who are not very familiar with France, uh, we have here um, um, we have we have here um, a map which shows the uh, the popul the who highlights the quantity of popula population immigrated to France and just to show you where my investigation town was a hundred thousand inhabitants town in southern France with a high um, a high quantity of migration of the Maghrebian um, popu uh, Maghrebian population. Um, so people from Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. And looking at these statistics, when you, when you look at, uh, at the discourses and statistics of Moroccan population, uh, it's repeatedly that Maghreb Maghreb Maghrebian immigrants come fr very often from, uh, from lower social classes. They hold very often lower, low qualified jobs, but of course you find Moroccan at all level of status, you find M Moroccan people at all level of professions, etc. But my families, uh, they were indeed fruit pickers, most, most of all were fruit pickers and they attended school in Morocco, but uh, the men normally went four, five years to school, the women not at all, or maybe one or two years, and then more to Quranic schools. Um, when we look a bit closer at the district I was working in, I, I modelized the dis district of the, of the town I was working here, and then the different linguistic landscape, if you want to call it like this, uh, is the yellow is French, so you have the, the big circle is the all over French, you have the French is the most, most important language in, uh, in the town I worked, and in the whole, the, the biggest surrounding of, in France is of course French. Then French is the language of school, so in, in, in the school people, the, the, the children are forbidden to speak uh, amongst them Arab, Moroccan Arabic. And uh, you have a district, the district where you, where you listen a lot to French, to Moroccan Arabic, code switching, or depends on the people, only Moroccan, only, um, uh, only French. And then you have the families which are much more focused on Moroccan Arabic, but uh, where, where members, of, uh, members of the family speak as well um, French among them. Um, and is, if, you, if you may ask yourself, where is Temazicht, so Berber language? This was, a, this was a district where no Berber, or in, in my knowledge, no Berber family lived. There were some persons um, with Temazicht background, but, no, but the most, the common language was Moroccan Arabic. Um, the green spots are written Arabic or standard Arabic, and they are, uh, and standard Arabic is present in a very particular points really in, uh, in the district, in the school and in the family. Um, in the district we have the mosque, uh, where you have uh, the religious pl place of the, uh, of the most families. Then the families, you have, uh, you have written Arabic, uh, I will show you it later, uh, in, the, in, the diff in, the, um, uh, in the living rooms of the, of the home places. There are a lot of surahs, a lot of Quranic verses which are uh, which are framed and which are very visible in the 
um, in the families and the families, a lot of family members read the Quran, so you have as well, uh, I, I, I could, I, I could attend as well this reading forms of Quran, they showed me how to do it. And at school you have Arabic classes, which is organized by the uh, Moroccan Embassy for Moroccan Children, uh, takes place twice, twice a week. And the, two, and the t ten children I will present you uh, attend, uh, grew up uh, in this district and they all attend the Arabic class of the, um, of, of the school. Um, the parents, the children's parents grew up in Morocco and most of them, as I, could t as I told you, went to school for, for some years and well, lots of them went to Quranic schools. So it's a quite religious surrounding with people who would be called illiterate for, uh, from the French hegemonic school perspective. And the school, so maybe it's, an, it's interesting to know that the school is in the district, but no teacher lives in the dis district without, um, apart from the Arabic teacher who lives over there and uh, one of the ten children is, was his son. So, um, but uh, normally, and, and, the, and the teachers perce perce perceive the children and their families as kind of, uh, as kind of um, in, a, in a decrease of social levels, so it was, it was very, very much complaining about their, um, about, about the, in French you would say clientele, <laughs> uh, of, their, <laughs> of, their, of their pupils. Um, but even if, the, uh, if the, uh, the parents of the children don't read very much, of course there are a lot of texts coming into the, lit into, into the homes. Um, and, the, and the families uh, read uh, letters from administration from different, different sorts. They read letters from the school, like this one. So, uh, the school letter has been um, adapted to the literacy skills of the, of the families in French. They, they read recipes, they read, uh, they, they read all kinds of text, advertisements, etc. And um, um, yeah, if, if you have questions about about certain slides, you can ask me in between, or, uh, or I, I, will, I won't focus on this, on this particular letter now, but it's, it's one of the letters attending the families very much. Um, and the reading is not done by the parents alone, or a, a particular person, the family alone, but it's always a, collect, a collective reading. Um, and the reading and writing is practiced in, a, in, in such a collectivity that it is guided by one person, which is always the same person. Very often, it's an older daughter who has been who went to school in France and to, uh, and to finished school in France. And this literacy guide, how I call her, translates between French and Moroccan Arabic, but she translates as well between the written and the oral code in general. So she translates very, very, very in a very uh, various way this um, this letter or other letters are uh, are read aloud then discussed then translated between French and Arabic um, and there is a uh, there is a big co reading maybe uh, which is uh, which is ongoing between the different family members and this competence of the literacy guide is highly valued and perceived as a cont contributing to the family solidarity and it's really part of this family and when I lived in this family I took sometimes part, I, I took the role of this family literacy guide because I was the most literacy part in the, per, uh, in the um, in, oh I was judged as that uh, <laughs> in, the, in the family. So in contrast, individual reading and writing in French is not seen as a relevant practice. Uh, so no one needs it really from the perspective of the, um, of the families because there is one literacy guide who helps out. And um, individual reading is, mo is most, much more related to, um, to, solitude, to solitude and not being part of the community. So the older daughter who figured as a literacy guide for the family, she loved to read the newspaper, for example, and she said that she never would read the newspaper at her home because there it's just not the, not, not, not the place to read it. Uh, but she reads it at her work in a, in a hospital. There in the morning she first reads the, the, the newspaper. And when I did reading for my, for my work, and I lived in this during my, my, my living in this family, um, I was very, it was, this was very much appreciated. But every 10 minutes about somebody came into, are you fine? Are you okay? Are you, do you need something? <laughs> so, and this kind of, my, myself doing reading in the families um, showed me very, very much how this individual reading is not, uh, is not perceived in the way that 
I would perceive my individual reading, but in another way. Uh, so that's about French uh, texts. Um, Arabic texts uh, are, look like this, actually, uh, and the uh, Arabic literacy or written Arabic is, uh, is very visible, as I said, in the households, and you have a lot of picture frames within different views of, uh, of, the, of the Quran. Here you have only Allah and Muhammad, but they can be a bit bigger. Um, and they are cr closely related to religious practices and uh, uh, already Kulmas in, in, in the end of the 80s, he described that, this, that these Arabic Quranic verses are kind of aesthetic objects. So they are not meant to be elaborated or rewritten or they are not, 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 not related to a change of a text, to an elaboration of a text, but they are kind of aesthetic objects, so they are framed. And that the families would, uh, would call these um, frames cadre, cadre is frame in French, and they, don't, they never speak about, oh, I have Quranic verses, as such, uh, such a word, on my, uh, on, on my, on my um, wall, thank you, <laughs> uh, but I have, uh, I, I have, I have these frames on my, uh, on my, on my wall. And this means that, uh, that it's, for them, it's a kind of whole, uh, kind, kind of entity, and the text in the frame is part of it, but it's it's not no matter what it what it really means. And uh, when I asked family members to read me such a text, they uh, they figured out what Allah is written, but um, but all the other words were unknown to them. So uh, that's, it was not, but it was not important to read it. But it was much more related to religious experience, to um, to experience between friendship, to to family members, to Morocco, to the home country of the parents, and it was much more a kind of remembrance of a lot of things, but n nobody needed to read it in this way. Um, so here you, we don't find the idea of the Western literacies to elaborate, to transform or to elaborate uh, and to, to correct, for example, a text. Um, just to go on with this, I, I, uh, I'm not sure very often people Oh, when, I, when I teach this in, in a Romans course, and, and I, I say kinds like this written form as an entity, um, oops, uh, it's very difficult for a lot of people who have grown up in Western Europe and have the only known Western kind of thinking academic literacy. It's very diffi difficult to grasp that there might be another kind of literacy. Um, and this is why I would like to show you uh, a, sm a small excerpt of, of an interview. Uh, translated in, in English. And it's an interview with a, mo with a mother um, who, uh, who tells me how she perceives uh, Arabic when, she, when she's what, yeah, when, how she, for, for her, what's Arabic for her. And she says, on Fridays I put my current tape in order to feel close to God. I like as well putting on the television and watch the prayers and what they say about Islam. Sometimes I understand, sometimes I don't, but it means a lot to me to listen to the voice of the imam who is talking. That's it. So here you have the same, uh, the same sense of it's not, um, not so much important what content, content is transported, what, what will I learn new, but it's much more related to, to a feeling of being secure. Um, when we looked at this, when, when we have these family literacies here in French and, uh, and in Arabic, we will move on to the Arabic class of the children as they go. The Arabic class is a secular class, so it's not a Quranic, uh, not a Quranic course. And these children attend Arabic class on the wish of their parents, who want them to relate to their, to their, to the parents' um, country of origin, because a lot of parents have still the idea to return one day. One day they will return to Morocco, um, and the Arabic class. Uh, organized by the, embassy, by the Moroccan embassy is, is uh, in the same impact, has the same aim to maybe uh, prepare the children who grow up in France, who are growing up in France, to go back uh, to Morocco one day. Um, the instruction of the Arabic classes takes, back, takes place during class time at the public school and the children who attend this class, this Arabic class, leave their regular class in order to attend the Arabic course. And 
the children I, I investigated um, have, class, have Arabic, attend the Arabic class for almost two years. And, um, but I realized that the Arabic class does not uh, enable the children to read or write Arabic, not even words in Arabic. Um, they know, know, they kind of know uh, Arabic letters. Some of them memorized very few words in Arabic, but they are not able to read something, even not a known text um, in, in Arabic. And despite the obvious language instruction, because it is, and when you attend the classes, it is, you, you, you look at uh, language instruction, nothing really else. Um, this first aim of the ELCO, of the, of the classes, of the Arabic classes, is not the acquisition of standard Arabic, but it rather presents, uh, it, its aim is rather presenting to the children a cultural practice and val values of the parental country of origin. And uh, when I talked to the, to the Arabic teacher, uh, he confirmed that. So he confirmed that he will never really uh, teach Arabic, standard Arabic, to these children, and, uh, but that he really tries to make a link between French society and culture and the family cultures. Um, but when you look at this course uh, during, the, during the class, Standard Arabic is never a language of conversation, but it is only the lesson, uh, the, really the, less, the lesson language. I don't know if you, if you call it like this. So the lesson I, I put in the focus here is a sentence, Karim lives in a big house with his family, and the children learn the letter R, um, this here. Uh, and then they, they say it, ra, ri, ru, uh, and uh, pronounce the letter with the different vowels. Then they pronounce Karim lives, lives in a big house with his family in Arabic. Um, and even that Moroccan Arabic and standard Arabic are quite apart varieties, there are still some things you could relate to them, so in, 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 in the terms of similar similarities or contrasts. Um, but when, the, the, when the, the children ask about some, uh, some similarities or some, 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 uh, some elements they don't understand in the standard Arabic uh, saying, the teacher is not able, I'm not sure, but he does not refer to that. He does not refer to this possibility of contrasting the language varieties. But it's in, and when I asked him and, and other, uh, other, uh, other parents, it's so unusual for, uh, for the Moroccan people I, I knew to talk about the language because it remains a dialect. It, 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 is the, the, um, it is the spoken variety all over, but it's for not, not, not usual at all to find relations between the dialect and the standard Arabic. Um, so, and in this secular context of the Arabic class in school, um, in my perspective, standard Arabic is again a distant and almost holy language. It's not a Quranic language, but it's so distant that, pe that the pupils don't really grasp it. So they repeat it, they have a kind of saying, not singing, but saying like, like repeating in, in the choir, etc. that it's really, it's much more related to Quranic classes than to the traditional French classes uh, they ex experience as well. Um, so that's about my ethnography. When I started again to look at the writing of the children, how do the children, how, how do these children who go, who, who attend a French school and as well Arabic classes, who grow up in a Moroccan Arabic French background, how do these children write? Um, Moroccan Arabic, so uh, a language they speak a lot, but they have never written. I asked me two questions. One question, how did the children cope with the spelling rules learned in French when they conceive a writing system for their family language Moroccan? So how do they grasp their knowledge of French in order to conceive another, um, another writing system? And do, do they conceive maybe as well a particulars of this writing system in Arabic? Do they use Arabic, uh, Arabic letters when they, when they know it? And do they maybe as well integrate um, par particular elements of the Arabic writing system, which is very different? Um, and then the second question, does the social background of the Arabic writing practices and the families obstruct the children's access to spelling rules? 
um, that was one observation I had in my ethnographic study, and I forgot to, to say about that. The Quranic, percep the, the Quranic perception of, um, of perceived Arabic texts as an entity has been trans uh, transported from some parents to every other text. So they looked at the homeworks of their children, and the most important, they, they were proud that the children were writing, and the most important for them was that it was beautifully written. Um, so it was not, it, um, they, they couldn't really read it, so they, they, they couldn't really follow the expectations at, at the classes. But it was, for them it was not acceptable that something was stroke out, or that something was, was not nicely written, that something would be a draft and rewritten. But the, the most important of a lot of parents was that it was beautiful. And uh, this kind of, uh, and this kind of observation uh, in my ethnographic study um, yeah, I interpreted this observation as a conflict because uh, the, the children grew up in these two um, attendances, the school attendance who wants them to, to rewrite, to edit it and to comment and to elaborate a text and the parents who obviously don't. Um, before I go further to the, to, the, to the writing forms of the children, very, very short introductions to French and Arabic orthography. Um, French is an alphabetic script, and it is, it is called a deep writing system, as English as well, actually, uh, where you have a lot of spellings which do not relate to spoken language. For example, uh, you don't have the, the, the um, flexion systems. It's, it's called um, orthographe grammatical, grammar, or grammar orthography, maybe. So really an orthography which is related to, to writing, and you don't, uh, you don't have the ability to to listen to it, you don't have an acoustic equivalent. Arabic is a syllabic script, as you know, it is, uh, the, um, and the writing here is based on the lexical roots, and I try to, to put it down so it's written from right to, uh, to left, sure, you know, and um, you have this different, different, and you have here the, the word rajul, um, and um, when, you, when, you, when you speak it, it's rajul, uh, when you and when, when you write it, you have here the article, which is a suffix, uh, prefix of the, of the noun, and then, then you have the, diff, the, the three different um, root elements, um, and you put uh, the the vowels in between, very briefly. Another uh, another particular particularity here is that the article is l, and in the written form, it is always stable. But when you have an alveolar um, consonant following, it will be a, a doubling of the consonant and uh, not an al anymore. So you have very different forms, and I was curious about knowing how, uh, how the children will, or to which writing system the children will relay on. And when I did my analysis, uh, I knew that the children had possibilities of writing their languages because they will. They, they relay on a particular knowledge of French, of the French orthography of, in a particular way, they learn for two years Arabic, in the um, Arabic orthography, or they may invent other signs which do not exist in any of these known languages, but I could do my interpretation in between these two um, language, writ, um, language writing systems. That was a picture story I presented to all these children and I asked, him, I asked them to, to write down these picture stories in all the languages they know. We did first an oral, uh, an oral orientation about what, the t what's, what is the um, story about, and um, we wrote the story in the Arabic class because I, I was presuming that when we would do it in the French class, nobody would uh, st start writing in Arabic, but in an Arabic class with with the Arabic teacher, there might be a surrounding where some pupils would like to, to start writing Arabic in what kind of, well, however. The texts I got um, were looking like this, so rather short text, that's a French text and that's an Arabic text from, from the same girl. And um, kind of these texts I got, uh, I got ten, 10 children, so all children wrote down um, 16 French stories, so most of them uh, wrote two French stories, not only one, and the French stories were containing on average 55 words, and nine of the children uh, wrote 
Mar wrote their stories on, on Moroccan Arabic and all together there were 12 stories in, in the output with on the aver average 22 words. So the, the Moroccan Arabic stories were shorter than the French stories, about half of the word count. Uh, one child refused to, to, um, to write down uh, Moroccan Arabic um, and this is an example. When you, uh, when, when you look at the French texts um, this, it illustrates that uh, the children in general and these children as well is familiar with the phoneme-grapheme correspondences. Uh, they separate orthographic words and correctly spell certain words. Um, but um, the girl here, like most of the other children, have major difficulties with the written grammatical structure of, the orthogra um, of French orthography. And um, I, oops. And when. Um, and when we just focus here, ils sont tombés. Um, so, um, the, yeah, when you look at the markers of French, the grammatical, um, the gra grammatical markers are mostly missing or placed on a, on a not appropriate place. Um, when you look at the Arabic, um, at, at their Arabic writing, um, she's, she uses lots, lots of the French forms. So, so she, she, st she started writing in, in French orthography, and um, and when you look uh, how she dealt with uh, with uh, Moroccan Arabic phonological features, which are not present in French and which are not represented in French orthography either, uh, you see that she helped her out um, with with other letter. But I will sh I will show it in a better way. So I think it's just not readable in this <laughs> uh, in this form. I have four tables like this uh, in order to show you what the children did. And the first, the first table is about French diacritics used in Moroccan writing. French diacritics are very much used uh, on, in the French orthography. They are very much used for contrasting e and e. So, and and uh, and you have the accent circonflex. I don't know in English, uh, a kind of triangle, um, which which exists as well for etymological forms. The children, when you when I first looked at the at, at the at the writing, I. Th I thought that the um, that the diacritics were used to to make much more similar the Moroccan writing to the French orthography, but the children used um, the diacri diacritics in a functional way. They used it um, in order to show to highlight um, phonemes who do not exist in uh, in French, like the pharyngeal uh, uh, pharyngeal consonants like oud. And here they, they put, they put uh, uh, diacritics on the vowels, which are more long, which are, uh, which are pronounced in a, um, where, where the syllables are pronounced much more in the throat. Um, and some, sometimes they combined uh, di diacritics with an R, uh, which, which was much more, s the most similar sound graphic present representation in French because it's uvular and so they did it they, they tried to um, to conceive really one sign new n known in the in the French writing for their Moroccan um, uh, writing um, another particularity is the more uh, the uh, that a lot of a lot of words in Morocco in Moroccan end of a consonant, and they are mostly represented with a final e, with a final graphic e, which is very conf confirm, uh, conform to, um, to French writing as well. And the children did not do it con uh, in a constant way, but maybe because, I don't know, French orthography doesn't either, so, uh, because so sometimes you don't have e's at the, at, the, um, in a, at the final position of a word. But uh, the most, most of the consonant ending words in, Morocco, in Moroccan have been uh, they have been adjusted by an E. What I found even more interesting that the children inserted graphic E's. Um, they inserted schwa's where uh, where you you would not really hear schwa a schwa in Moroccan Arabic. So um, and they they tried to and in Moroccan Arabic you have much more consonant clusters than in French. And uh, why are this little E, some, sometimes it was R, but normally it was E, uh, and um, the letter E. They, um, they tended to have uh, a syllabic structure of 
consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. So that they tried very hard to get the structure you will find in, in most French words as well. And uh, finally, they had the, def the definite marker, um, which they wrote in three major different forms. They, uh, the definite marker in, in Moroccan Arabic is l, uh, <laughs> so, and they wrote it always in the same, f they wrote, wrote it always as l, even for alveolar consonants, which were following uh, where you would not have an r, uh, uh, l, but for, but for, for example, in, um, like Rajul, double, double r. Um, so, and they followed the French, French orthography in a way that they use sometimes the L apostrophe, which is completely correct in, in French when you have uh, a following uh, word starting with a, a vowel um, or with a written H, that's possible as well. Um, or they d did it isolated, uh, which would not be a French word because you cannot have an L, an isolated L, but still it's, uh, it seems possible to me. And some of them as well uh, put the uh, L at the following noun. And here I was asking myself, and I don't have an answer, if, the, if these children who, uh, who put kind of, uh, who, who wrote the definite marker as a prefix to the noun, um, do they follow Arabic rules or not? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm hesitating because their, uh, their written Arabic was so, was so poor um, and because one knows when, when you look at French children and fr French uh, um, um, fr French language acquisition and fr French writing acquisition from French monolingual children, they very often um, use the L as well at, as one cluster with the noun so they don't really separate at the beginning and I think it's, it, uh, the reason is, is more here. I will resume and uh, disqu discuss quickly, um, and I will return for that to my to the research questions I, um, I I showed you at the beginning of my talk. The first research question was how did the children cope with the spelling rules learned in French when they conceive a writing system for their family language Moroccan. The one of the answers I found uh, were that the children represented all Moroccan. In, in Roman script, in the Roman script system, um, uh, they some of them tried to um, uh, try to start with Arabic script, but then they uh, uh, they wrapped it out and they uh, started again and did it in Latin script, the Roman script, and they used their knowledge of specific orthographic and grammatical rules of French. For example, they uh, they they conceived Moroccan Arabic phonemes with French orthographic features uh, which, which were really built up in a new way. They used the apostrophe in order to represent, uh, in order to present uh, the definite article. They, they used diagra uh, diagraphic markers in order to, um, to, sh to highlight phonemes which are typical in Moroccan Arabic. Um, and uh, what I said, um, they, they represented uh, the article, the definite marker as a prefix maybe. Um, and if, uh, if they had followed an Arabic rule, the most salient rules of written Arabic would have been the representation of the lexical root, the emission of short vowel vowels and a consonant representation of the definite mark as a prefix. So that was what was I was expecting when I started my study, that they would try to figure out part of these writing system um, and not really follow so in a such intense way or such close way um, the French way of writing. Um, the second question I was asking was uh, does the social background of the Arabic writing practices and the families obstruct the children's access to spelling rules? That was one research, uh, that was, was, was one result, one perspective I've gained during my ethnographic work, that the family literacies are very rich, but in a way they may obstruct the, the, literacies, um, it, the literacies required in the school system of the children. And so in, in this way, um, being in a kind of, conf yeah, taking or giving the children a kind of conflicting situation. Um, the orthographic study um, showed that the children do have access to orthographic and grammatical structures and that 
and when you look at the French texts of these children, the French texts are very poor in, about, in, grammat in grammatical <coughs> um, features, but their knowledge seems to be very much enrooted, may very much based, and uh, when you look at orthography as a uh, cultural accommodation, you, you really see that, that, the, that the children uh, integrated very much in the, um, in, the, in the French writing culture, I'd say this. So the, fr the framework of Arabic writing that is associated with Quranic writing in the families and available, available in the um, standard Arabic class did not support access to literacy in Arabic and not to French either, I'd say. However, it did not oppose the acquisition of French writing either. Um, so, because when you see that the children are able to do such a com complex um, process of abs um, of abstract um, abstraction, abs abstraction, abstraction, thank you, <laughs> um, then you uh, and this ki this process of ab abstraction is so deeply rooted in the French orthographic system. I think that these children, uh, yes. Oh, I have kind of very much integrated. If you if if you want to get in this discourse in the French school system, and at the time of my thesis, um, this integration debate about was very very much uh, very very loud. Actually, very um, very much around me is are these children uh, have these children are these children part of France, are they integrated in France, are they the others who should go back to Morocco, there is some problem. And um, on this also graphic level, I've, uh, I, I have the feeling that I, um, I, um, that I had evidence that they, uh, that they are, of course, in, uh, grown up in France, that there is a kind of integration process which is maybe not as visible for the French teachers which have these children at school, but um, they, they just did not see this kind of knowledge and abstraction process the children do in the context of French literacy. Thank you. You say stop. One more. One more. No, no, maybe the other direction. Never mind. This one. No. Does the social background of the Arabic writing? This one. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood that. Do you? What writing practices do you need when if when the parents are? Do you, do, you, do you just mean the fact of having the, the texts in the house? Yeah. Um, the, li the literacy practices of the Arabic families uh, are very present, even if the, the parents are, me are meant to be illiterate. It's about when, when you look at the French texts or the French literacy practices in the Moroccan family households, uh, it, the collective writing, which has a very particular literacy practices. And uh, when you... Um, when and when you um, when you think that every literacy practice, so liter literacy practices at school, literacy practices in Western Europe, literacy practices wherever, uh, ha are framed with particular norms and um, expect expectations of readers and of writers, these literacy practices are are there, uh, and they read and write collect collab collaboratively texts. So and. Uh, in this, this is a surrounding which, when, you, when I did ethnography, perceived as this may be conflictual to the children who see at the one at the one time the coll collaborative literacy, yeah. which and on the on the other time this very individual literacy expectation at schools, and on the other hand, Arabic literacy is as well, where you have all these Quranic verse uh, frames. <laughs> Uh, which are written texts, of course, and which are um, read in such a different way than the readings which are expected in the schools. I, I guess I was confused by the fact that this is 
referring specifically to this better means. I mean, I, I can see how it would obstruct their um, access to uh, oh, okay. literacy in general, but specifically to this better means. I, I think yeah. But I think that if if it would uh, if um, if the ch if the family literacy is uh, obs um, obstructed the children's spellings, the children would not be able to to spell to conceive to conceive this highly demanding uh, new writing system for their family language. That was my my idea. So that if they they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't, because you have to, you have to gain uh, an idea about what a spelling rule is, why do, how words are constructed, that words are not a whole that, um, sorry, I will, that's very rude maybe what I'm doing now, um, that words are not conceived like calligraphies, but uh, in, a, in a text you could elaborate, right, you could reformulate and correct this, and, and where you have, have to separate words and you, where you have to, uh, to respect a certain orthographic, oh, graphotactic maybe, graphotactic regularities where particular consonants follow particular vowels, or written vowels, written consonants. And this would not, have, this, in my opinion, would not have been possible without a certain input in, the, um, in what is writing, and writing in a Western schoolish way. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> you, could, you could actually, one, one could actually, if we go back to that one, um, slide where it says conceiving a writing system, uh, yeah, um, this one, yes. um, no. this one? Uh, no, maybe this one? Yes. Um, you can actually perceive similarities with, um, in, if you look at it from a different direction between both languages and the way that they represent words, because in neither language is the word necessarily written as it's spo as it's spoken. So one, um, mm -hmm. you know, both of those equal. You know, the one at the top, um, for those of you who don't know French, Il porte. Mm -hmm. with the, uh, as the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in the in the Arabic, um, but they don't. And, but the spelling doesn't necessarily represent the pronunciation. In yeah. Arabic too, the spelling doesn't necessarily represent mm -hmm. the pronunciation. So you've got, you could actually see the word as a block in both languages. Yeah, yeah right. And that's what they're doing. Um, I, I, I went to the French school, and it's not just non-native speakers who write in this way. Um, quite literate sometimes, or much older um, people writing in French as a first language will make basic mistakes of parts of speech in their writing. Yeah. Because it's a homophone. Right. Yeah. Completely right, yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, completely right. The children. The only the only thing I would I would maybe uh, adjust is that uh, or put put on is that these children are expected to to have much to have skills which are much more related to 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 grammar and not um, which they did not have acquaint. Acqu okay, there's expectations, and that's what they actually have. Yeah. I think, uh, in lots of languages, people don't necessarily recognize the rules. Yeah. Of, of yeah. Their language, the Difference in right. No, but it's an immediate question. <laughs> in the slide you had earlier with the, with the various possible sources for conceiving a writing system, the last one was invent other signs which do not exist in any of the known languages. <coughs> this was, yeah. And then did we see some examples of those? Oh, sorry. Uh, you mean this one? I'll the next no, the, no. The one conceiving a writing system. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. th do you mean this one? Yeah, the third option that we went other side. Yeah, okay. If, if they did it. They, um, they, no, not in this corpus. But I, uh, I looked as well as Occitan speaking children as, as I tried to do a comparison. And the Occitan children, um, as a bit different framework, they learn Occitan and they learn French at school. Um, but they invented Occitan, for the Occitan they invented science. They invented um, some kind of uh, um, uh, um, I don't know, Kringel, kind of circles, uh, kind of circles in, in, the, in, in order to, to, sh to sh highlight um, uh, to highlight 
um, syllables they they would pronounce much more than in French, but the words were so similar. So s some of them inserted signs for their orientation, I think. And I was not sure if that was a kind of educational fact, but it was not part of the Occitan orthography. And, as, and I've seen it in another, in another more recent project of French children, French foreign language in German, uh, where I tried to, to, to do a dictation for, for French words and, uh, and nonsense words. And they're dependent on the background of the children, which have been in fourth grade, and some and a lot of background. A lot of these children had migrant background, and some were literate or had, had were alphabetized in their language. And the Turkish children, they really they um, integrated very much Turkish signs in the French writing, uh, in order. So these kind of other forms. Um, but here. I was just um, resuming the possibilities I expected to see. So I, I expected to see um, different markers of the Arabic and of the uh, of the French writing system. But I expected as well maybe other other forms of Tamazight script or other other forms they have known or calligraphic nice figurations as well. I expected these other kinds of signs, but there was nothing. <laughs> I was um, kind of curious if you would expect to have slightly different results if you had done um, if you had done the um, uh, orthographic test that you did uh, in the in the in the predominantly Arabic speaking homes, uh, because I perceive that the children might have, might have might might perceive that Arabic is 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 um, entirely the language of the home, and, and outside of that is 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 you expected to write things in a French in a, in a French style. Um, even if it's even if it's an Arabic class, they might not even really, I don't know. It's uh, I just I perceive that there might be that kind of um, kind of that di dichotomy um, there. Um, so I, I would imagine that you might get you might get different results if they were in the homes you know, Arabic environment in the home of their home in France. Of the home in France, yeah. I don't think so actually, because it was such a weird question uh, of this. M weird foreigner who was living in this Moroccan family who tried to, to learn Arabic, uh, to, to ask the children to learn, uh, to write something down in Moroccan Arabic. I don't think that that would be an impact. An impact would have been, um, one of the children had, uh, was, so uh, nine children uh, were the children f um, in families of mostly fruit pickers, uh, so low literate uh, families, and one was, was the son of, of the Arabic teacher. And if the, if the Arabic, if the, if the uh, educational background of the chi of the children were uh, very yeah I'd say higher. So if and the Arabic teacher tried tried to teach his son more Arabic than he could do the middle classes. So he encouraged his chi his son to to write in Arabic, and uh, and this son really tried to, really to first to to write down in Arabic. And I think if the surrounding of the other children would have do the same, he would he would really try. It hard to write a text down in Arabic. But uh, as all the other children gave up very quickly, or they even don't try to do so, um, this son did not, did not do the effort either. Uh, I think that, that, was, um, that's, that, that would be the difference. Yeah. Is, it, is this situation, um, do you think this situation is uh, reflective of the, um, of the kind of the general surrounding area of the whole of southern France? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah. And this, the the idea that Morocco, so this n not not a, not a, yeah I don't know educated background, who is curious about languages, who is curious about talking about how to how to talk, how to read, and who's not um, who's not reflecting about it. Um, and um, another study where um, I did my, um, where I was referring very much during my PhD um, from Utsmaas and Ulrich Mehlem in Germany, they looked at Moroccan families in Germany and in Morocco and um, looked at the writings as well. So they did the same experiment in letting children and adolescents writing down Moroccan Arabic in Mor some, some places in Morocco and some places in Germany. And there the ideologies about Arabic language and Arabic dialect Moroccan and Arabic um, 
uh, high Arabic standard, Arabic written Arabic, however, it reveals how different they are in the, in the immigrant context and in the Moroccan context. And then again, in between um, educational, um, oh, sorry my English, Schichten? layers, no, do you say social layers? Yes, so educational social layers, so that, that's, that's the main, main difference. Hmm. That's, so, for the record. Genau, genau hinter dir. Just hit. What implications do you assess for bottoming up development of foreign countries in general for a person like this? Uh, to bottom up the orthographies of the languages or for, of the of the read of the writers in, in order of the children uh, so in a, pedagog in a pedagogical way to bottom up uh, I'm not, I didn't understand it fully so rather than the orthography being developed by the state or some similar institution and then being imposed on okay. speakers mm -hmm. the speakers uh, in, in the way that Oh. They're, they're doing here. Okay, I got it. Good question. Very loud as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have maybe different answers. My personal answer in terms of a researcher was that I started doing that I thought that teachers know so few about literacies around them and uh, that it is really a shame they don't know very much about their orthography either so they the um, about the French orthography either <laughs> and not nothing about lit about their home literacies around and um, so since having finished my PhD which is quite a while as well I'm f I'm framing on uh, how can we researchers try to um, modelize orthography in a way that teacher understand the regularities in orthography and do a better teaching first. Uh, that would be an idea in order to met better understand not what is only say what is right, what is wrong, but as well to, uh, as well to understand transitional norms, transitional writings, a kind of development of writing acquisition and reading acquisition. Um, that would be in my way one way because then you <coughs> Reflect, or then you then you have the uh, possibility to go f beyond the prescriptive norms of French language in a school system, and then maybe you can as well reflect on other writings, for example, at this Moroccan writing, or being curious about what happens when these children write some another language, and then you can get you, you can just go beyond these prescriptive norms and try to establish variable norms, transitional norms in your classroom or in the schools and yeah, reflect much more on what, what the children are doing, what yourself are doing um, instead of saying, that's right, that's wrong, you're bad, you're good. <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'm very interested in this. Maybe. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Um, so, I think what I got from your examples was that the children are versed enough in French spelling rules to pick up those elements of French writing that are phonic and then transfer them. Yes. to kind of phonic encoding of Arabic. Now, of course, the literacy acquisition is quite asymmetric because they get a lot more input in French mm -hmm. than in Arabic. Um, but um, I was wondering if you've ever thought about inversing this and seeing how they would write French in Arabic characters. That's interesting. And whether they then would actually follow Arabic spelling rules. Um, so that, that was kind of the first question idea. And then um, mm -hmm. another question I have is that these children are learning modern standard Arabic in a secular setting. Yeah. And if you have any comparable study or ideas of studies that have been done in immigrant settings where the children attend Quranic school, 
Two of them go to Quran classes. And I did not did not see any very difference between the children actually, but maybe I I don't have I did not have the the right glasses and looking at the differences, that's very possible. Um, I know that Ulrich Mehlem, my colleague in Germany, uh, who's at Frankfurt, he does a lot about well, he did he did a lot about Moroccans in Moroccan families and children in Germany and he wrote with uh, he worked together with um uh, Quran Verein, so Quranic associations and Quranic schools, and uh, and and his results about writing Arabic don't 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 differ from mine. So I'm I'm not very sure. Um, but the other the other idea is very very nice, I, and I didn't think about it. I, I didn't think of it. Another idea, <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, in in the paper that Sohna Badia but I have discussed this volume on African literacy, we can establish the concept of lead language for by scriptural writing in Senegal. So it's people are in general when they are exposed to or initiated to writing in the Roman script, it's in French. And when they're initiated to writing in the Arabic script, it's in, in classical Arabic, so the language of the Quran mm -hmm. settings. And so that leads to an association of the script with a particular language that then becomes a kind of lead language. So, which means that whenever they write in Romanist writing, the lead language is French, so you apply French spelling rules. And whenever you use Arabic script in writing, you use not modern standard Arabic, mm -hmm. but the particular regional tradition for the writing of the Quran, which is different from modern standard Arabic. So, no. Of course, here you have a clear alignment between one script and one language, but it would be really interesting to look then at biscriptal children. Mm -hmm. No, no, bilingual monoscriptal children, mm -hmm. and vice versa, mm -hmm. and see what, what happens if, if a child, for instance, uh, speaks and writes two languages using the same script. Right. What happens, and often we transfer in those settings. Right. Is there anything? Not, uh, not my knowledge. No, I don't, don't think so. Is but it, that would I don't know. Really relevant also, you know, for, for your question, or in general, for when you think about writing, minority yeah. languages, etc., or faculty development, to to know what actually happens to bilingual, biscriptural, monoscriptural children in these yeah. contexts, what would help them most. There's a lot, a lot of articles at the moment appearing about um, Arabic writing um, acquisition. And in Morocco, some things about uh, between Tamazight and Arabic, mm -hmm. but I don't. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not not as not not enough in the field at the moment. So I read much more about other things, not Arabic, at the moment. <laughs> There's, there's, w there's one other question. Maybe, maybe it's a good point to conclude on. Can you put up your very last slide, your, your <laughs> conclusions? Conclusions on the second, oh, yeah, one. this one? So I wonder whether given, as you mentioned, the highly political nature of, of this, um, not just in France, but yeah. lots of us work in yeah, countries where this is, is similar, but also across Europe, whether your last statement couldn't be a little bit stronger. So, however, it did not oppose the acquisition of French writing either. I mean, actually what you have is, seems to me, a really impressive innovation yeah, from um, these young people in what they know of what we have to admit is already a very complex writing system, which is French. Mm -hmm. It's by no means one that you can, you know, it's not as you pointed out with your examples. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got these rules you know, swimming around, um, plus the Arabic, which they get very little exposure to in terms of writing in terms of, what was it, two hours a week? Mm -hmm. classes a week? Mm -hmm. yeah. Given that, not only did it not impose, but actually what they do, it's really like, quite impressive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, that was nice to thank Yeah, you. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On this note, I, think <laughs> I should thank the speaker again for a very inspiring Thank you for the discussion. <laughs>